introduce myself. My name is Gareth Edwards. I'm Digital Services Manager at University of Greenwich. Um, my colleagues will be speaking in a while. You've got here, we've got Nick Ashton, who's my lead designer, and we've got Jamie Cameron, who is lead developer. Now, what we wanted to speak to you today about was, at the back end of last year, we were involved in a, a large but rapid project at Greenwich to really do a complete kind of uplift of our online experience. And so we thought we'd give you a bit of a run through of how that went today and, and what was involved. So to give you a bit of a background to begin with, um, Greenwich in 2015 was a university undergoing an awful lot of change. That was change on an institutional level, but also within the web team as well. Um, in fact, up until the beginning of 2015, there hadn't really been a web team at all. There were people within the institution doing various bits of web in different faculties and directorates, but no one really consolidated together, although Nick was here already and was leading on things from a, from a marketing department perspective. So 2015 was about establishing that web team, and we also had uh, a vice chancellor who is very technology focused and was very keen that we start to move forward online and do things, do things better there. And he was very much driving the idea that we needed to invest in that and improve in that. Um, and I'm not just saying that because he's the chair of JISC and is probably actually watching this as we're speaking. So the difficulty was that at the same time there was a perception that web people could be a barrier to change rather than people who could drive it. And that was not necessarily because they didn't trust in the internal abilities of people who were there, but it was just that natural build-up you get in an institution where people start to be seen as a support function more than the function that actually drives things forward. Now, in the summer of 2015, our Vice-Chancellor helpfully um, announced to the university that by the end of autumn this year, we will have a new website. Um, that was news to us as a newly formed web team. Um, and that left us with roughly about, at that point, five months in which to deliver an entire new website. To give you a background on that website, we've got about 14,000 web pages. Um, we've got a mixture of external and internal content. Um, and all of that content is actually managed by 300 devolved users spread across 11 faculties and directorates. Um, we've also got an unknown number of what came to be known as rogue sites. So these were sites that had cropped up because people, they, they felt frustrated that they couldn't get their things through, so it popped up elsewhere. And the last major redesign had been carried out in 2010. But as is often the way with these things, once the first visual elements of that design had been delivered, there would not been the support for the web people dispersed through the organization to really push that through and, and, and drive it to completion. So as a result, we actually had at least three different designs of web pages across our website and our web estate where previous redesigns hadn't been completed. So to give you a couple of examples, these were two of our, our, our earlier ones that were still popping up all over the place. And this is the actual front page of the university website as it was in the 2010 design. Now, it was a perfectly good design if for 2010. And again, I'm not just saying that because Nick did it. Um, I'm also saying it because it was, yeah, it, was, it was good, it dealt with what it was at the time, but obviously the world had moved on hugely since then. Mobile was huge and everything else. So to give you an idea of the web team that was tasked with this six-month rebuild, that would be five people. Um, that was myself as digital services manager, that was lead designer and lead developer, and the good news was we did at least have two contract staff. We had a PHP developer who also was capable of working within our CMS, and a Squiz Matrix developer, and Squiz Matrix being our CMS. Um, then the contractors left. So we were down to three. So to kind of recap on the challenges we faced, we had a small team, we had a large website, little time, lots of stakeholders, and still that kind of lack of confidence in the ability of an internal team to deliver change. Now, what we wanted to do despite this was we knew that what we didn't want to do was repeat the mistakes that we'd made in the past. What we didn't want was just a fourth design to add to our three designs that were already available across our entire digital estate. So, uh, anyone who's been, I mean, anyone in this room who has managed a website for more than two years knows that there's one dreaded word, which is the reskin. The reskin is the thing you do when you don't have time to do anything else. And that tends to feature in kind of the standard university <laughs> website life cycle. <laughs> you build your fresh website, it's quite nice, it has a few holes, but it's generally pretty, 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 pretty good. Um, over the years of everyday use, it tends to creep in, gaps appear and everything else. And then you quickly reskin it, and it doesn't really come out quite how you expected it to come out. 
Now, we wanted to break that cycle. And our approach to breaking that cycle was to really turn around and look at what was happening elsewhere within the industry, but also things that came up at events like this and say, no, look, we do need to break this cycle. And the, luck, well, the good thing was, because we had at that very senior level a vice chancellor that understood technology, we could turn around and pitch and say, no, look, look we, you don't want this. You don't want us just to do another fourth version of this. Let's do something else. So we put down and said to break this cycle that what we needed to do is we needed to put our users first. We needed to really build in that ethos from scratch of saying they are the people that should drive the decisions that are made in this. We also then wanted to create a platform for future development. This couldn't be a reskin. It had to be a platform on which we could do future changes and, and, and future improvements. And we also had to deliver dem demonstrable change. And that was because if we didn't deliver, demonstrate change to the organisation, if we didn't deliver on time more than anything else, then we were never going to be given the, the, the trust and the opportunity to drive change again. They would always see web as a support function, not as a function that, desired, to, to, that pushes things forward. So that's the end of my bit. And uh, so with the institutional quote, which is an actual quote that Jamie said at the time we were trying to do this, um, I'll hand over to Jamie now, who's our, our lead developer, to talk a bit more about how we, we engaged and how we, we pushed through our, our preparation for this. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. You're good. Can you understand me at the back? <laughs> right. Uh, well, this is it's, uh, early summer. And um, the, the VC said, we want, you want some new website. And we said, that's all right, boss. OK, boss, six months, sure, we can do that. Uh, let's have a look at the brief. And we took a look at it and went, uh, all right, OK. A bit light on the metrics. What are we actually trying to achieve? Where do we start? So obviously, you start with your users um, and your audience. I think we all agree that these are the questions that you would want to ask um, when you're trying to establish what your users want. But at that point, we're already starting to hit against the culture of the institution. Um, traditionally, and the, the web team is guilty of this to some extent, we tend to passively uh, accept the feedback and the recommendations of the loudest group of stakeholders in the university. And this is going to be the group that's got the best or the most accepted or the easiest communication channel with the senior stakeholders and the web team itself. And this is going to be staff. So you end up with a website which is skewing towards an audience inappropriate um, uh, uh, content. And uh, it's either audience inappropriate or it can be downright petty. I mean, I think we've all sort of had the forwarded emails, um, you know, dear Vice Chancellor, I was trying to find a catering request form and I couldn't find it on the homepage. Therefore, I went into a meeting today with no biscuits, sort it out. And, um, you, you know, you, you sort of like, deal with these sort of emails on a regular basis, in the end, you start accommodating them. And that, that's a really bad way to go. So um, the other thing that that's, uh, quite, quite often happens is you end up being driven by consensus decision making. Um, it's, it's a classic thing in institutions that you, you, if people say, we need a decision list. They say, All right, we'll form a working group, and we'll get a decision on that in a few months. And we just don't have the time. You know, it's a sense of urgency. So you've got staff who are, expect to be consulted, but um, no, no time to do it. You know, like academics, you know, we love you, but we've only got six months to change the website. Um, so where are we going with that was um, we really needed to, to look at um, how we either break that cycle or break that culture or incorporate it. And that's when we looked at bringing in precedent, an agency to work with. Okay, so these are all the things that precedent could uh, bring us. Um, the, if I could sum it up, they could bring us sort of concept, communication, and validation. Um, I, I think uh, it was the best world in the world, I and mean, we all know that web teams are renowned for their communication and social skills, but primarily we are a technical design and implementation group, and um, these, these are a set of skills, these up here, are, which we just simply did not have, or did not have the time to develop uh, in order to, to hit the deadlines for late, for late autumn. So, um, I mean, precedent as an agency could offer us not only um, expertise and knowledge of the sector, but the industry, 
And quite often when you're in the uh, sector, or the education sector, you end up seeing your industry from the prism of the sector. And so it's important to sort of break out of that and see it as a holistic thing. Um, they also, uh, they were resourced to carry out um, workshops and to create concepts and things. And they were uh, really helpful for um, actually getting some of the skills that the team needed, which didn't have, into the, uh, into, into the project. Uh, for pretty early on, they were, they were developing the, uh, the, the workshops and the stakeholder engagement tools that we needed to get feedback from our core uh, stakeholder groups and widening it out to not just staff, but to students and prospective students as well. Um, they developed the user personas, which are very helpful for, uh, well, critical for keeping us on the sort of straight and narrow for making sure that we were developing our site along user journeys and audiences and not just, um, just sort of drift, uh, drifting off of uh, our project goals. And lastly, I just want to say something about external validation because it's very easy when you begin an agency to feel that. Um, you know, they're just, they've paid a lot of money to tell you what you knew already, and you get a bit defensive about it. But that's kind of the point. And that when, 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 when they come to us and say, well, these are our findings, and they were similar to what we'd ourselves thought, um, you know, that's actually a good thing. We say, that's great. Now, can you take exactly what you said to us and repeat it to these guys over there? Maybe they'll believe you. And that, that's exactly what happened, and it was incredibly helpful. Um, this is an example of one of our personas, and what this is is a, a, a case study basically taken from the feedback from one of the, uh, the uh, stakeholder groups, the, sorry, the, um, the, 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 work, the groups to find out what the, uh, what the different us users um, uh, wanted from the website, and you put it together and you create a fictional character in this case, a, a prospective student for the university. Finally, we didn't ask prospectives to give us a three-month redesign because it, would be, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be utilizing everything that they could deliver us. We, get, we asked them where, how we could take the website forward in an ongoing, um, ongoing st stages. And so we said to them, like, we'll worry about the deadline and how we'll implement it. And that's what we're going to talk about in a bit. And that what's important is what we got from them was, a, was a, a, a sort of a stage model for how we take it forward. I'm going to pass over to Nick to talk about triage now. Nick. We are on a six month project to deliver something that um, precedent said was quite an aggressive timeline when they thought they were getting six months and then we were getting six months. Um, we're a team of five that's become a team of three, and we're three months in to that six months. Were we worried? Well, no, not really, because we, we'd sort of done that deliberately. Um, we knew we needed that build-up. Did we start building? Well, we didn't, um, because we knew that we needed to know what we were going to build um, from what we'd been presented, which was a long goal. We needed to know what we were going to do for our short goal, for that deadline, which we'd agreed with the Vice-Chancellor that December was in autumn. <laughs> and we had, um, at the same time, um, we had our BAU tasks, uh, obviously, we had no time um, to do that, to do the kind of testing we'd want to do, um, to, to put in the code we'd need to get that long goal. Um, we'd need to be keeping those senior stakeholders up to date the whole time. And, of course, resist the creep, which we all know. And what we needed, I think, as um, Gareth alluded to, though, what we needed to do was to have success. Um, and I don't know if any of you would recognise the idea that you can't achieve anything because the organisation you're in doesn't trust you to achieve anything. 
because you don't achieve anything, um, because the organisation really doesn't trust you to achieve anything, we needed... That's the cycle we really need to break. We needed to have that success, and that was really our key thing. Um, because the, really the goal of having a new website by autumn, December, was fairly artificial. What we wanted to do was turn that into a long-term win. Um, so we needed to agree the core product in order to define what success was, um, which I, I think Neil kind of alluded to some of this stuff here. Um, who are those users? What do they need? Um, what, what are they looking for? Um, you know, we, we, we didn't have mobile at that time. I'd been trying to push that for three years um, without any luck, but we, you know, we made sure that was part of the requirement and it would be seen as success for us to deliver that. Um, and also by looking at not just uh, other organisations uh, in the sector, um, in the UK, but um, US, uh, Australian um, institutions, and of course uh, external, you know, non-education non things, um, to point to things that we would be um, calling success for us, uh, and getting those senior stakeholders to buy into that as, as, as what success meant. Um, obviously, there's a, a, a some irony in us standing in front of you, telling us, telling you not to do what other um, universities are doing. Um, but there you go. Um, and that meant looking at what our launch goal was, what our launch point was, um, and resisting that urge for features because you're going to you're going to find things that you think would be great to go in um, your organisation is going to find plenty of people who can tell you what would be great to go in um, there will be no shortage of ideas um, and it's a matter of at each, start, at each stage of those things, putting them through the tests, basically so you can bat them away, because your goal is more important than that. It is that success. It is that launch on time. Um, and the things that make it in, it's not necessarily whether they're good or um, whether they um, meet this audience or that audience's need. It's how they get you to the point of launching something that's successful on time so that in the future you are the part of the organisation that delivers good on time. Um, which means the last point on there, how complex is it to design and code, is as important as the other three. Um, as the Basecamp team might say, um, the first rule of Triage Club is we don't talk about new features. So, having rejected uh, a lot of things, at least temporarily, we, we put our, our, our triage categories uh, together, starting with uh, things that we wanted um, to be able to put things in, which was where we, we're inheriting Obviously, uh, a website with uh, a lot of classes in, a lot of images that we don't have time to replace. Uh, parts of the site we knew were going to have to be done with minor changes, and we um, tried to put as much as we could into that category. Things that needed extensive HTML um, changes, uh, CS, obviously CSS changes were across the, the, the place, but that's the point of CSS. Um, there, there were a fair few um, uh, points where we needed the structure of the pages to be different a lot quicker than it was possible to do that with three people who were also deving and doing BAU, which meant we did put in, and we weren't frightened to put in hacks on uh, JS just to make sure, in, in a progressive way, that the pages had that structure 
across the board when we delivered. And, and, and um, there were also pages that we knew we were going to build from scratch. The home page, obviously. Uh, things that we knew would be big impact, um, big win, low cost, um, and, and it was just easier to do it that way. Um, and then we had a minimum viable product. Agreed with uh, the VC, with, uh, the, again, the senior stakeholder group, and that we knew we could deliver, having looked at it, having looked at what we've got as designs, that we can do this in that time and maybe have time over for some of those additionals. Um, and we said we'd do the top two levels of the site because that seemed to be a key phrase that people like the sound of. The top two levels of the site, we'll do that, yeah, no problem. Homepage, obviously. Uh, the last two weren't even in at the start and we let them creep into our MVP when we knew that it was possible. But the key thing is that you need to know with your launch product, at the beginning you need to know that you can hit it. When you get near it, you need to know how long it's gonna take you to get from where you are to it being launched. Um, and that gives you uh, your, uh, your, your route in. And uh, Gareth's just gonna talk about how we actually did the build. Yeah, so we're, we're got about a month and a half left by this point and we haven't actually done much coding at all. Um, and as Nick says, that was deliberate because we knew that we had to you know what our minimum viable product was. We knew we had to be tight. We knew we had to define it and get it sorted down and done. And we only had three people. But again, luckily, the Basecamp team agree with us on this one, which is if you can't build your version one with three people, you either need different people. Uh, and in the university life cycle, that's not often an option anyway. And luckily, we were all brilliant at what we did, we think. Um, or you need to slim down your initial version. And that was why we were so tight on our MVP, and that's why we said we've got to keep this tight and we've got to keep this good. Now, it's very easy to throw three around, but actually there were good reasons for that. So within the build process of this, as we entered the build, what we ended up with is, is, is a, a basic principle that there are fixed roles that people need to hold and there are flexible roles that people need to hold. Now, the three fixed roles we had were design lead, which Nick was playing on this, development lead, which I was playing on it, more because my strength in, in background and development was originally JavaScript, and we knew that an awful lot of the heavy lifting on this was going to be carried out in script. And implementation lead, which Jamie fulfilled, because that really required a really heavy knowledge of our CMS and how it worked, and Jamie was the person who had the most knowledge on that. Now, those people were not the people who make the sole decisions on those areas, but when there is a tricky decision or a major decision, they would be the people who would make that decision. And by doing that, we were able to ensure there was a consistency of decision making through the whole process. There were also three floating roles, and this was just the pragmatic acknowledgement that you, with something like this and the time you've got and the people you've got, you can't be fully agile. You can't be entirely kind of scrum-based. You have to turn around and say pragmatically, how do we deliver this? And that meant accepting that at various points, people were going to need to be in meetings. They were going to be telling, writing those emails that tell people that you're freezing content. And that would be the role of the communicator, or whoever's holding that, that hat at a given time. There's also the support staffer. We had to do BAU throughout this. And actually, the best way to do that was not to have everyone vaguely watching their inboxes and trying to do things constantly. It was to turn around and say to the rest of the university, and they were happy to do it, look, we're going to be able to do less of this, but you are going to get a win out of this. But what we will do is make sure that every Thursday or every Friday, we will get to all of your tasks and we will look at them and we will try and sort them. And at different points in the project, depending on who needed to do what, different people would play that role. And there was also the tester. Because at any given point, you're pushing through design changes, code changes, everything. And you don't want the person who's doing that testing that. Not only because it limits what else they can do, but they're not, they're not impartial. They can't spot the things that you've missed. Now, obviously, that was the roles. But how do we actually manage this on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, we use a technique called, which is using Kanban boards. Now, Kanban grew out of the kind of the, the sort of the, the Japanese car industry. And really, what it focused on was getting production lines lean and slick and, and, and working. But really, what it boils down to is that at the end of the day, all tasks, everyone's tasks go on a to-do to list. And that to-do list you make is, is as granular as you need it to be. And you prioritize that list every morning. And then what you do in the beginning, of it, whenever you've got time to work on things, is you take one item from that list. You take the top item, the highest item you can do, and you move it onto the doing list. And everyone can only have one item on the doing list at any given time. 
And when you complete it, which hopefully you do, you move it off of that list and you move it to done and you select the next one you can do. But actually, where this benefits and where this is really useful for in an institutional environment is it has an innate acceptance of the fact that at various points during that process you're going to get hijacked. You're going to get pulled off because you know, some academic somewhere has now found that their staff profile is completely broken and they're giving a talk and it has to be fixed. So what it, this acknowledges is that what you can do is you can take things off of the doing list and put them back on the to-do. And then someone else can pick them up or you can pick it up later, but you get a very clear picture at all times about what's going on. Now this is a, a, just an example of our, one of our Kanban boards. This was actually in Trello, which is a free tool. You can use it. It's brilliant. And really, you can see the principle of the lists there. Now, one of the reasons we liked Trello is because it, you, know, you can actually tag individual people to who's, who's working on things. And one of the things you'll notice on this slide, actually, is that you'll see one of those rare instances where actually someone's tagged to a, an item on the to-do list, even though it's not been moved off yet. And actually, we found early on in our process that that was actually a critical thing to add in because that was a task where we had identified that only one person on the team could do that task. And therefore, there were times when that task might only be the fourth item on the list. But if Nick's looking at it and Nick knows he's got the time to do it, he's better picking that item because Jamie and I can work through the top three. Now, that was how we approached the kind of the day-to-day -day management of that. But what did we actually do on a, on, a, on a site level? Well, the key thing for us was actually taking the approach, and this is as much about future-proofing as anything else, of separating our concerns. And this was a, a basic software principle of saying you need to work out what your different layers of almost activity and substance are and treat them in separate ways. Now, the advantage of that, and I don't, haven't seen our Squiz representative in the room, so I think we're all right. The advantage of that is it means that when you've got separation of concerns, if you need to drop one of those layers at some point and bring a different one in, it's a far easier exercise. So you reduce your kind of vendor lock-in, which is a huge, huge thing to do in this sector. So what you ended up with, or what we ended up with, was three layers. We had our content layer, and this was really about serving up that content. This was delivered via the CMS, and it was our semantic HTML. It was structured in the right way, and it came from there. We had our design layer, which was obviously CSS, and we have our script layer, our JavaScript which, as Nick says, we weren't afraid to use, as long as we used it in a progressive way. So the rules for our content layer were that our HTML should be as standardized as possible. And this was largely the domain of the, the implementer. They were there to kind of make sure that our CMS was delivering it up in the way we wanted it. Critical to that was really an exercise of going back and removing so much styles in JavaScript that just crept into our CMS, or paint layouts that were there delivering things, because they do creep in. But by being there, you, they prevent you from really being effective elsewhere. And that was, and turned up being a huge task, was, was effectively stripping our HTML back. Um, it also almost had some casualties, which was, which was at one point, I remember, Nick and I decided that from a JavaScript and a CSS perspective, what we really, really needed was a, was a, a class on like 90% of our H2 headers in the CMS. And we made Jamie go back and put it on all of these things. And then about three days later, after he finished it, we worked out that we could actually work without it. Um, and I think at that point was the closest we came to being murdered. Um, what was crucial, though, was what we needed to make sure our other layers would work would be that our content layer, our HTML, would always effectively tell the other layers where they were at any given point. So for that, we used a principle called namespacing. And that was very, very simply the fact that what we would do on a page-by-page -page basis, on a section-by-section -section basis, is we would dynamically al allocate a, a class to, to each of our pages to say so that the site itself knew where it was at any given time. What that meant was that when the design layer kicked in, we could not only make it human readable and lean, but we could also take advantage of the fact that they're called cascading style sheets for a reason. You can cascade with them. And what that means is you can write general styles that apply to everything, and we did in that place. We, there, for the majority of the 14,000 pages we had on that website, we wanted a white background on our first level divs on those pages. Brilliant. That's a general rule. It's going in the general rules. Actually, for our articles, we didn't. So on our, on our article namespaces, by extending our CSS classes, we were able to turn around and make it so that we only delivered those things out in that way. Now, I won't go into depth on this. If anyone wants to talk about the tech side of this at another point, grab us at any point and bring beer and we'll talk for far longer than you actually want us to talk about it. So finally, the rules for a scripting layer was that scripts should not be required, but they should progressively enhance the user experience. So what this meant was no user coming to our website should be inconvenienced by the fact that they're not running JavaScript, even though it's a very small percentage of users who do that now. 
What it did mean is we could turn around and improve the experience for those who did have it in. Maybe that was a, something as simple as, as changing up the layout or adding extra functionality on menus, but it would be there. Also, more critically, what that allowed us to do was take the approach of saying, as Nick alluded to earlier, that where there was a choice between writing some CSS that would just use the old classes that had lurked in, the C in, 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 in our site for ages, or to write new CS CSS that would work for our future site and the path we wanted to, and then use JavaScript to make the old pages behave in the same way, we would do the latter. And by doing that, that meant that what we weren't doing is creating this enormous bulk of code that was only relevant to our older pages. We were not a big enough team to be able to do that if we wanted this to be a forward-thinking project rather than something that was just about doing old things. And finally, we, could act, we actually worked out how we could deliver specific scripts based on namespace as well. And by doing that, what we really, really reduced was it meant we could only call in the right JavaScript to the right sections and, again, reduce our testing overhead because there was a far lower in, in, in potential for things like code clash or race conditions or anything like that. So that was really how we built it. Now really what we'll just kind of move on to now as a final section really is to talk about what really matters. And as, as I think we've all said all the way through this, our key goal with all of this was we knew we had to deliver. And I know it's a semi-apocryphal quote, but it's a good one and it's not a proper tech presentation unless you end with a Steve Jobs quote in it somewhere, which is a real artistship. And that's what we did. And the lessons we learned from that was launch at 95%. The biggest flaw that we, we potentially have as institutional bodies is we are always questing for that perfect thing to launch. Whereas if you've defined your minimum viable product, if you know what is the base level of success you need to do, if you know the base level at which your users will get a better experience, then there becomes a point where it doesn't even matter if there's still a few features you're tidying up. Your users will get a better experience, so put it live. And that's really what we did. And again, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that the web is an inherently changeable medium. We're not writing books. Whatever you launch, it probably in about three months' time is not going to be what it turns out your users wanted anyway, as Neil alluded, to, alluded so very well earlier. So don't be afraid to launch. And again, as Nick said earlier, know what your countdown to launch is. We knew when we'd hit our MVP. And probably shouldn't say this in case anyone from Greenwich is actually watching it, but we hit our MVP actually about two weeks out. We already knew we were launchable with two weeks to go. But what we also knew was that gave us the ability to turn around and look at what we hadn't built in and what we could improve and what was high on those features lists that had almost made the cut but hadn't made the cut. And we also knew that we needed basically about four days to push the damn thing live. And we'd done pre-tests and we'd run test deployments to prove that that was the case. And then finally on 1st of December 2016, so yeah, that, that very last day of autumn, famous last day of autumn, um, we pushed live GRE v1 and feedback was excellent um, surprise within the institution and without that actually we delivered on time um, more more and again and again uh, going back to our, our squizzer rep our squizzer rep was wonderful I won't name her but I remember her ringing me up on January 5th I think it was and asking how our redesign was going um, and I said you mean the one we were meant to be launching on December 1st and she said yes yes now how's it going I said we launched it on December 1st and she said <laughs> really we're not used to that. I said, yeah, well, maybe you should give us some more free features now and pay us a bit more attention. Um, but it's that kind of approach that we knew we needed to hit, not just for our internal stakeholders, but for our external ones as well. So we over-delivered in the end because we, we did it right. And what did we over-deliver? Well, we improved subject pages as well. As Nick alluded to earlier, we improved our course search and search autocompletes. And that was actually based off of some of the feedback and metrics we did have, which highlighted that actually on average, only about 25% of our site visits started on the homepage. But actually, of those 25% of the site visits, they all went to the search and they all wanted to find courses. So actually, by turning around and really improving our autocomplete level, we reduced it so that they really were finding those courses quicker. And actually, they were finding them within the typing of three characters rather than having to type a full search. And from feedback and from our user journeys and our user profiles, we knew that that was a critical design requirement, certainly from a millennial perspective. And finally, um, with all of these projects, never underestimate the power of a lucky win. Now for us, a lucky win was the fact that when we actually sat down and looked at it and went, right, we've agreed to push this design to the first two layers of this website, actually it's far easier to push it to all of them. It will be more work for us to push it to the first two. So actually we pushed it to all of them and then quite rightly pointed out that we'd over-delivered and that, that was a win. 
What do we descope? Again, the critical thing for this was that launch at 95%, but all the way through was turning around and constantly asking ourselves, is this something that is going to delay us? And if it's going to delay us, is it critical to the users? Because if it's critical to our launch users, then either we need to find something else to drop or we need to drop it. And actually, the things that tended to drop out were actually things we found we didn't need. Image galleries and management was one of the big things we dropped. Actually, we found that most of the sections that really mattered to our users didn't use galleries heavily. They tended to pop up in places where, where people were trying to almost promote themselves rather than promote the courses. So actually, we, we, we de-scoped them and we pushed them back. Dynamic homepage. For the first two weeks of our new site being live, the homepage was entirely constructed out of flat HTML. Now, that was partly because we were still tweaking the design and wanted to see how people used it. But it was also because we worked out that actually we wanted to make it more complex and easy to manage, but our PR department weren't capable of, 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 of doing that straight off the bat if we were doing it through, through HTML. So we managed it for those first two weeks because they weren't releasing stories long, fast enough for us to worry about it. It could be a BAU task we took on, and then we built a better management module later on. And finally, fac faculty-specific versions of the homepage. Originally, we'd planned to do similarly kind of over-designed versions for the faculty homepages, but again, actually, they weren't high, that high traffic, and we worked out we could drop it relatively easily to a later date. And new layouts for news articles. News articles are one of those things that every site has, but actually we found that our core users were not reading them. They were there, again, to promote the PR, and they met that purpose perfectly fine for the multi most users. So the only thing we actually did do was we came up with a nice future-proofed long-form article layout. Because actually what we didn't want to do was say, well, we can't do anything with these. We want to say is, look, if you work with us, this is the kind of stuff we can do going forward. And we were able to launch with that and launch with that on the homepage and linked off of the homepage, and people really liked that. So finally, what happened next? Well, we implemented the things we de-scoped. We've pretty much covered all of that list now, and it's, and it's all in there. We've also found that now that we've got that kind of growing acceptance that we delivered, an awful lot of the kind of rogue sites that exist are starting to voluntarily re-enter the fold. They're starting to turn around to us and say, look, how can we use your design principles? How can we use your designs? How maybe can we actually re-enter and be back on the main website again? So an awful lot of that is actually due to the confidence that within the team and the university now to actually that we can deliver. And again, for us, that was a critical role. And the one of the big reasons for it to go back right to the beginning was because we knew if we could prove that we could deliver, then we would get that next nine months to carry on doing this as a project. That they would say, OK, you delivered a win for us. We, we, we got a really nice experience. Our users are much happier. What else can we do now? And as, a, and as an institution, we're far more confident about doing that now as much as, about, as a web team. And what that's leading to is an awful lot of new focus and work, actually, on our user journeys, on how we move people through the site, on our navigation, which is anyone in this room who has sat down and tried to take an institution through uh, the, the eternal question of who gets on the menu is always the most fun thing you can ever do in a web team. Um, and also a new focus on dynamic and programmatic content. And we're doing some really interesting stuff in, in that area. And hopefully, maybe we can talk to you about that next year. But that's us. That was our project, and that's what we delivered. Questions? Uh, Sam Trafford, University of Liverpool. Um, I don't know if it's something that I missed, but you had the consultation with the agency that did the, um, the sort of research behind it. Did you go to a design agency as well? Um, precedent, effectively, one of the beauties of working with them was that they were able to deliver some high concepts of what they wanted to do and what we were able to then use them to test that against kind of key user groups and everything else. So what we did a lot of was test those high concepts, but again what we said to them was, look, we don't need you to worry about how this works in HTML. You know, we don't expect them to be entirely complete. What we do expect is you're giving us a kind of an overarching idiom, a kind of an idea of how this should feel more than how it should actually behave. So what they weren't doing was saying every single element on this page is going to be built like this. What they were doing was saying, here is a broad range of primary palettes. You want to use this metro style because that's what's really testing well when we, when we start pushing it at your key audiences, your, your kind of prospective students. So they gave us that high level, but then we actually worked out how to implement that. And Nick led heavily on how we actually deliver that on, a, on an actual basis. Hi, uh, Mandy Phillips from Liverpool, John Walsh University. 
Uh, first of all, congratulations. Um, I felt your pain having gone through it last year and the stories were remarkably similar. Uh, what I'm interested in since you've gone live is how you're using analytics to give you um, some more insight into what you do next. It's something that we're just starting working on hugely. Um, we've used it already to kind of tweak some of the elements of, of what we did and what we delivered because now we're trying to be in a much more kind of iterative state. We turn around and we, we look to kind of aggressively change things regularly. We've made further tweaks to how we do autocompletes. We've switched different to different autocomplete library because it wasn't completing fast enough and that was clear from the metrics. Um, but actually one of the big things that we, we are looking to do and are hoping to push forward to next is we pushed things like Universal Analytics to the site finally for, from, for our Google Analytics a little while back. And really actually what we've still been doing is we wanted to almost give things, the, the really detailed things about six months to bed in and see how things happened. And not least because actually university website traffic is cyclical and it changes based on the portion of that cycle. So if we turn around and said, actually, we need to make changes to our site based on this is how people are using it in December, we'd actually be probably not doing anyone who is trying to use it in clearing justice. So th there's, there's lots of work there to be done. The good news is, actually, is when we say, and it goes back to what Nick was saying earlier, is like when we turn around to people and, and they say, I want to do X because I think people do that, is we can turn around and say, that's nice. Where in the metrics does it say that? OK. Thank you, Gareth and colleagues. I think that was a, uh, a great example of a pragmatic talk sharing real, you know, experiences with, with a wider community. So can we thank speakers in the traditional way?